fairy tale, Hundreds Years Quest, continues on with chapter 10 titled Cruel Diablos. Now this is a chapter that has been long expected for a while, and that is Team Natsu versus the villains of this story arc, namely the Dragon Eaters of the Diablos Guild, who appear on the, sc on the scene thanks to Scullion Raider's um, Ash ability that somehow ties into transportation. I still do not fully understand how that works, but that goes with that's irrelevant as Mercuphobia is completely pissed to have some dudes roll up in his crib talking some trash. However, when he goes on the attack, Scullion Raider manages to easily dispatch his bell um his water blast with his turn things to ash ability. Um, he also manages to completely bind Mercuphobia with Ash Bindings, I guess? Um, saying that without his power, he is unfit to eat. Which, uh, you know, all this talk of eating someone with the fact that he has, Mercuphobia has this human-like appearance makes me feel fairly uncomfortable to a certain degree. It's just like, nah, this feels like cannibalism when he's in a human form. Naturally, everyone gets ready to go in, namely Urza, Grey, and Natsu. And slowly they start picking out their dance partners. Because as Natsu goes in to strike down the Scullion Raider, um, he's easily dodged thanks to Scullion Raider's observation hockey, or just the fact that he's apparently a Logia. Because it's very weird at the fact that Scullion Raider is so easily able to turn into Ash. How this ability works is just weird, because we've never... You know, it's one thing to just, like, turn into certain things to a certain degree, but it's not like Natsu goes full on, I am fire, I can no longer be harmed or anything like that. You know, he's able to send out more fire, but that's about it. I mean, maybe with uh, Rogue, he was able to turn into shadows, but, you know, this ability that Scullion Raider is showing off just seems a little interesting. And it's even suggested he would be able to turn Natsu completely into Ash. But this is interrupted by the intervention of Urza. And ultimately, Scullion Raider starts clashing with Grey specifically. Meanwhile, Kyrie chooses um, Urza as her opponent, wanting to go blade to blade. And getting turned on by their clashing of weapons... Meanwhile, Natsu picks up Mad Mori and decides that he will be his opponent. And he goes in on Mad Mori with a fire dragon sword horn, which does absolutely jack squat, besides send the two of them flying into the air. Natsu goes again with his fire dragon's king's demolition fist, which is a mouthful in and of itself, and promptly manages to pretty much shatter his hand on Mad Mori's armored dragon scales. He, Mad Mori takes this opportunity to pretty much toss Natsu right onto the um, ship of the of the um, Diablos Guild, and thanks to this, Natsu is kind of incapacitated by his inability to, you know, be on vehicles. His constant motion sickness that apparently most dr that most Dragon Slayers share. But ultimately, this is not something that the fifth generation has in them as well. Although that. We may see that further down the line because a lot of other characters didn't suffer that at first, only to suffer it later down the line. Although that just might be Mishima's writing. You know, I love Mishima. I've been a fan of his since Rave Master, but 
something about when he writes fairy tale, he just likes to just pull stuff out of nowhere with no real reasoning. And this is shown in no greater effect than with the Battle of Ursa Scarlet and Kyrie of the Diablos Guild. As for the most part, this is an even match fight, with if anything Urza seeming to have the upper hand. But then Kyrie sends out this slight shockwave that just makes its way through Urza's being. And suddenly Urza is just like overcome with the fact that she's in nothing more than a bikini. And we come to find out that Kyrie, through some means, managed to slice through Urza's very strength and self-confidence. How this works is totally beyond me and reeks of the very problems that a lot of people have with Fairy Tail. You know, I'm interested to see how Urza might overcome this, but at the same time, it's just like, will she overcome this in a way that makes sense? That'll show just how far the author has come up into this point? Or will Mishima ultimately pull something that just makes you go, that's an ass pull that makes no sense? You know, and we get that explanation of, oh, how did she overcome this? Because she's Urza. And it's just like, I love Urza, don't get me wrong. She's one of the most capable females out there in all of Shonen. But at the same time, to have her just overcome something without an explanation or any real struggle on her part, you know, just... It happened too often in the original series to the point where it made Urza feel like less of a character because of that. And I don't want to see that continue on here. You know, maybe if they explain it a bit better at how she'll overcome this, like because she's been at this point where she's been subservient, but strength is something that you build. Yes, you know, strength and pride and emotion can be cut down but you build it back up you know it's not emotion is not something that stays in one place forever it's something that fluctuates that's what makes us human we're you know able to adjust to our emotional state over time and sometimes it could cause us to overcome great things even our own fear when it comes to doing what needs to be done you know if it's something to that effect maybe but even then i don't know people are already ready to hate this and i don't want to you know but at the same time it's that power creep all over again or it's just like Here's the newest incarnation of badasses, you know, stronger than the last group of people we fought. I mean, to a certain degree, it's fine because it shows that there are people who are just as capable and strong as the fairy tale guild out there in the world. That's what the Alvarez Empire was all about. But at the same time, it's just like if they're just going to be taken down in the same way that we've seen over and over and over again throughout fairy tale, then what was the real purpose of even telling this story? You know, what loose ends are we wrapping up through this continuation? What purpose does it really serve in the greater scheme of things you know at least with things like boruto it's just like well we get to actually see naruto when he's hokage you know that's the thing it's just like well was naruto an actual good hokage how was he what did he become you know actually getting to see what we had longed to see after all this time made it a little worth it but this hundred years quest is just kind of like, well, did we really need this? It's just like we assume they went on the crest, did some stuff, you know, came back home. But if it ends up being nothing more than a lackluster story, then there was no real point in telling it in the end. If it doesn't really go anywhere or add on to anything, 
just like, hey, there were other dragons out there just as powerful as Zachnologia. Too bad you don't get to see them in action because the one that we've seen so far had his power stolen. It's just like, mm, it's hard to consolidate that, to reason that. It's just, uh, you, you, I, I'm going to give this series the benefit of the doubt, but I can already hear the hate coming through more than ever where people are just going oh it's more of the same bail out now it's all the same crap that we saw with the last series but hey tell me your thoughts in the comment section below what do you think about where things are going up into this point do you think it's some bs that kyrie is somehow able to cut through emotional states you know, um, what do you think about Mad Moral's armor? Do you think Natsu is going to manage to punch through it just by hit it harder? You know, that lovely trope that um, Team Four Star used to do with um, Dragon Ball Z. Bridge is just like, hey, man, he's still tough. We can't defeat him. And Goku would just throw out, what if, and stay with me now, we hit him harder you're like oh my god i would be so disappointing if that happens at least with um gray and the scullion raiders just like just freeze him freeze all of him freeze all of him solid bam there you go leave him like that go about your merry business no more dealing with the scullion raider because th at least his power seems defeatable you know you're basically taking on Crocodile, but with Ash instead of Sand. But, you know, if you liked what I had to say in this video, leave me a like. If you didn't, feel free to give me a dislike and subscribe to see what happens next in Fairy Tale: The Hundred Years Quest. Fingers crossed that it's something good.